Hello and welcome to this video of training on teaching athletes who have impaired vision. This was prepared for Canadian Adaptive Snow Sports. This is aimed at new volunteers who will be helping teach skiers who have visual impairment. It may also be useful as a refresher for candidates aiming for their CADS Level 1 or Level 2 certification especially if they don't frequently ski with visually impaired skiers. This version of the course is somewhat minimized and focuses exclusively on skiing. There are longer versions of this course that cover snowboarding as well. So we're gonna start by talking about snow sports in general for athletes with visual impairment. Things like what kind of equipment do we use and how can we understand and relate to visual impairment. So what do we know about visual impairment, visual acuity? A phrase we are all com conversant with is 2020 vision. We think of 2020 vision as meaning perfect vision, great vision, but what does it really mean? And how does it relate to measuring impaired vision? Well, 2020 means that you can see at 20 feet what most people can see at 20 feet. So that doesn't really mean that 2020 is perfect. It's kind of average or it's okay, good vision. The numbering system has that if we say 2100, that means you can see at 20 feet what most people can see at 100 feet. Clearly, your vision is then not as good as a typical person. You need to be closer to see or read that sign or whatever it is. So if 2020 is typical vision, uh, 2050 is the lower limit to be able to pass a driver's test in Ontario. 2080 will allow you to read an alarm clock at 10 feet, and 2200 is the threshold of legally blind. So not everybody who is legally blind is in fact totally blind. They just have eyesight at 2200 or worse. There's another system, uh, the B system, which is used mostly for para-athletes in the Olympic in the competitive levels. And there we talk about B1 of B as being profoundly impaired, blind. B2 is a severe impairment, and B3 is moderate. And these become classes that people compete in. The limitation of both of these systems is that they suggest that visual impairment is a linear scale. In fact, it's more complicated than that. People may be able to see perfectly well in certain spots, but have limitations to the range of their division. Look at some of the examples on the right hand side. Some people have peripheral only vision, macular degeneration. So they can't see what's in front of them directly, but they can see out of the sides of their eyes. Conversely, other people have tunnel vision, more like looking through binoculars. They cannot see around the edges, but they can see directly in front of them to a greater or lesser extent. They may have problems with contrast. They may have patchy vision. They may be able to see light, but not shapes. They may have difficulty with depth perception, perceiving the horizon line. Everybody's vision is somewhat different. So knowing that somebody has 2080 vision is not the end of the story. You really need to talk to them, get to know them and ask them about what works for them and what doesn't work for them in terms of vision. As an example, one athlete I know prefers skiing at night to skiing during the day. This may seem paradoxical. Uh, 
for a visually impaired skier, but during the day, sunlight on snow makes everything just too bright and they can't really make out objects. It's just a whiteout. At night, they can deal with the contrast and they can see the other people on the hills and the other objects on the hills more clearly. So uh, definitely need to think about the individual rather than just their measurement. Snow sports for visually impaired athletes is really much the same as other snow sports. If I compare skiing with a visually impaired athlete to skiing with an athlete in a sit ski, uh, the mechanics of the visually impaired athlete are just like a typical skier. The equipment they use is essentially just like a typical skier. There is very little in the way of specialized equipment or alternate unique mechanics uh, to be taught. So we can teach them using standard drills. But some things are going to be different. Uh, the most unique thing is that they always need a guide. With a sit skier, I can teach them to ski and ultimately, hopefully, they will ski pure, completely independently. With a visually impaired skier, even if they reach Olympic levels, they will need a guide helping to tell them when to turn left, when to turn right, how to avoid objects on the hill. Second thing that's different is that we often teach by saying, watch me, see what I do, repeat what you see. That may not work out well, especially if their, their visual impairment is stronger. So we may need to replace that with touch. We'll talk a lot about touch and permission, uh, but you they may need to use their hands to discover even basic things like how does a ski boot fit into the bindings and attach to a ski. And because we have this role of the guide, the guide talking to the skier and telling them which way to go, in a noisy environment like skiing, we may have a lot of equipment focused on helping us with that communication as we should see. So here are a couple of pictures of uh, a snowboarder and a skier who are both visually impaired. Everything I've highlighted with the blue arrows is perfectly standard equipment that an able-bodied skier would use. The only two things which are unique is a high visibility vest and a helmet light. Why do we wear a high visibility vest? Well, it's not really for the benefit of a blind skier. Uh, they can't see that they're wearing the vest. They know that they're a blind skier. It's really for the other hill users. The vest identifies that there is something unique, special going on here. And maybe the other hill users should give some extra space, some extra margins around this person who may not be able to avoid them so easily. The guides also typically wear a high visibility vest, often in a different color. Uh, and again, this helps other hill users avoid us. It may also be useful for the visually impaired skier if their visual impairment is not too bad uh, they may be able to follow a guide more easily if they're in a high visibility vest. The helmet light is something we use when we're skiing at night. And again, this helps other users on the hill recognize that there's something special uh, and something to be avoided here. It's a flashing light. Uh, that just clips onto the back of the helmet, typically through the goggle strap. 
with a little flashing red LED light. So the standard colors, uh, certainly in the National Capital Region, are that the athlete has a yellow vest and the guide wears an orange vest. In this case, it may have been swapped. Uh, uh, sometimes I've swapped with my skier. If we find that they can see me more easily if I'm wearing yellow as their guide uh, than if I'm wearing orange. Quick comment on goggles. Do visually impaired skiers need goggles? Yes, they do. Uh, they may hurt their eyes with the brightness of the light, even if they can't perceive it. Uh, we've also had skiers who have glass eyes and their glass eyes can fall out if they have a fall. When skiing it is much easier to find their glass eyes and replace them that if they are caught by the goggles than if they've fallen into the snow. So let's move on specifically about skiing and teaching skiing. So in this scenario, we have been assigned to a new visually impaired skier, uh, maybe for the day, maybe for the season. We are just going to meet them in the lodge first before we go out skiing. Uh, what should we do? How do we relate to them? And how do we learn about their skiing? Well, we can learn about their skiing and about their visual impairment through the standard mantra of ask, observe, test. And there is a lot in the CADS manual suggesting lists of things that you can ask, observe, and test. Some things that you could ask, tell me about your visual impairment. How long have you had the visual impairment? Are there any other disabilities that you have, other sports? Tell me about your visual impairment. It is great to find out if they have patchy vision, uh, tunnel vision, if they have difficulty with shadows, etc. How long have they had the visual impairment? It can make a lot of difference in the conversations you have with them if they have been blind from birth rather than recently become visually impaired. If they've recently become visually impaired, then they may know what a chairlift is and looks like and does. They may know what a pair of skis is and does. If they've been blind from birth, you're going to have to explain those things. Secondary disabilities are always good to know about. I had an issue with a skier I was teaching who was visually impaired, but things were going well and we took the chairlift to the top of the mountain and then I found out that they had a sciatic nerve problem uh, if they did exercise for more than 10 minutes at a time. Getting back down from the top of the mountain was a problem. I should have asked about that beforehand. What other sports do they participate in? This is a classic question ski instructors ask. It gives a vocabulary about actions and body positions uh, that they can relate to and it also helps us gauge how fit they are, how risk tolerant they are, how much they uh, are willing to throw their body around. One thing we should avoid asking is how did you become visually impaired? Uh, that may be asking them to relive the worst day of their life, the most traumatic moments of their life, and we really don't need to know. We only need to know what can they see and what can't they see. Some things you can observe. When they're walking about the lodge, do they walk about the lodge confidently? Can they avoid other people? Can they grab a chair, pull it out, sit down? Uh, if they are 
are looking for a pair of gloves? Do they look for them on the table or do they search for them with their hands? If they're pulling something out of a bag, do they look in the bag or simply do it by feel? All of these things will tell you how visually impaired they are. Similarly, when you're talking to them, do they make eye contact with you? Uh, do they look when they're putting on something like ski gloves? Some things you can test. You can test, is their vision better in the sun or in the shade or in night? You can ask, but then you can also check. You can look at their walking. You can see how they react to noise. Another thing you can simply test is their eyesight. You can stand in front of them and say, can you describe me? Tell me what I'm wearing. Can you see my hands? How many fingers am I holding up? Uh, start with your hands together and then move them apart. Say, can you see my hands now? Can you see them now? Can you see them now? to get an idea if they have tunnel vision of how big or narrow their tunnel is. As you're in the lodge, you may need to move around the lodge together, get to the ski rental, uh, get outside, uh, go to the bar. Here's a couple of ways that we typically do this. Firstly, Ask them, do they need to be guided around the lodge? If they are fully blind, they probably will, or then they may prefer to use a cane. In both of these pictures, the guide is the gentleman on the right, and the skier is the lady on the left. Uh, in the picture on the left, she is holding his elbow. In the picture on the right, she has her hand on his shoulder. And in both cases, this allows you to walk around together, maintaining contact with the guide, determining the path and making sure that between them they don't run into objects. You may need to do things like say, okay, can you step beside, behind me and follow me because we're going through a narrow door. Uh, you will probably be maintaining some kind of a commentary on where we're going and what we're doing. They don't need to know everything about what's going on in the lodge, but things that could affect their navigation, like there's a table, there's a chair, there's a pillar, we're going through a door, we're stepping from a carpet onto a metal grate. These can all help their understanding of what's going on. One thing to point out is that being a CAD's guide does not include being a bathroom attendant. Uh, if they need to go to the bathroom, that's a separate topic and is not considered a normal part of being a ski guide. There is a video on YouTube that I would recommend. You can find it by going to YouTube and searching for How to Assist a Blind Person by Steve Fox. Uh, it's about five minutes long, a lot of good information. It talks about things like when you walk into a room with particularly a blind, fully blind person, say hello and say your name. Hi, it's Colin. They know you're there and they may not have recognized you by your voice. They can't see your face. Let them know who else is there, particularly if they are, are, the other people are not talking. If there's a object like a chair or a drink or a pair of ski gloves, let them know where it is. And you may be able to describe space to them and objects in space using a clock analogy. Okay, Steve, I've put your burger and fries in front of you. Uh, there is a fork next to the plate at the nine o'clock position. Your Coke is at the two o'clock position. It's not opened yet, it's a can. There is ketchup at the 12 o'clock position if you need it. Once they've got that information, they may well be 
able to eat their lunch independently. So I recommend watching that video after this one. Now we've got to the point of introducing them to ski equipment. This is particular for somebody who has never been skiing before. There's a lot of equipment to explain to them, the helmet, the boots, the goggles, the poles, the skis, etc. We're going to play a little uh, recording here of a typical ski instructor explaining the equipment. Okay, so this is a ski pole. Uh, you've got a handle at one end with a cloth loop, and at the other hand we have this thing called a basket, which stops it going into the snow if I push it in like this. So when you put it on, you're supposed to let it dangle from the handle, put your hand through like this, and then pull down so that the handle is inside your palm. If you just have it like that with the handle around the outside of your elbow, that's a problem. So was that a good explanation or a bad explanation? It was a bad explanation. Uh, for a visual person accompanied by actually showing the object may be perfectly good. Um, but for a blind skier, there was far too much of like this at one end, uh, this thing there, general descriptions and allusions to what he's pointing at. Uh, what you probably need to do with a blind skier and maybe a visually impaired skier as well is give them the equipment, let them feel it, and move their hands around and maybe uh, assist them with that and go, okay, this is the thing called the basket that you can feel now. Explain what the basket says. This is the loop and the handle and so on. This step will probably take longer than for ordinary athletes. Uh, we need to get them comfortable with the equipment before we can really get them learning. So you may spend 20 minutes, half an hour, uh, explaining the equipment, letting them handle the equipment before you move on to actually putting on the equipment and going out skiing. If they're handling skis, maybe they should be wearing gloves, especially if the skis have been recently tuned. We don't want people to cut their hands on the skis on the edges before we even go skiing. If they need to go to the rentals, uh, you probably need to go with them. They're going to need some guiding through the process, and they're going to need some guiding putting on their boots, uh, carrying their skis, etc. Okay, so... Okay, so now we have gone through the lodge, we've got to know our skier, we've learned about their site, we've introduced them to the equipment, we're bringing them out onto the beginner hill for their first ski lesson. A lot of teaching materials talk about learner types. There are these four different styles of learning that people do, and most people have a preferred one. Thinkers like to understand the physics behind the situation uh, before they actually do anything. Doers, on the other hand, just want to do it repeatedly. Feelers want to feel the equipment, feel the uh, process, feel the snow. What about observers? Observers typically watch and learn by watching. Is that possible for a visually impaired skier? It certainly is. Their brain may work that way, even if their eyes don't. And they may have a, uh, they may be able to watch, depending on their visual impairment. They may be able to use feeling as a way to understand. Not feeling in action, feeling the moving on the snow, just feeling the shape of the ski, feeling the shape of a boot. Uh, doing things like if you want to teach them the good position, then maybe you need to stand in that position and let them touch you 
to feel what that position looks like, observing by touching. Okay, now we've got into the dangerous waters of touching people. Touching people should always be done by consent. Every day, every time we're going to touch uh, our skiers or we think that it might be a good idea, we should need to ask, is it okay if I move your arm to show you how I want you to, your arm to be held? And this works both ways. Uh, you may need or want the skier to touch you to see how you've got your equipment, you've got your stance, where your hands are. But you don't have to allow them. They have to be comfortable with it. You have to be comfortable with it. Um, make sure that, that there is definitely consent at all times in both directions. I would also say uh, do this in plain sight of other people rather than in a closed room in case there is any misunderstanding and confusion later. People who have lost their vision uh, before the motor skills had been learned, people who were blind from birth, will probably need to learn differently and take longer to learn their motor skills. So there's a, a huge difference between the athleticism and ideas of running and balancing between somebody who was, say, a, an active soccer player who subsequently lost their vision and somebody who has been blind from birth and never really participated in the sport. Lean to turn may be a new concept for them. In a visually, in a lesson for a visually impaired skier or boarder, there are different roles that you as a volunteer may take. It's important to know what role you're taking on a particular day, on a particular run. We're going to talk about all three. We're going to talk about instructing, guiding, and blocking. So the instructor is the same as any other ski instructor. The, the goal, the responsibility is in teaching technique, teaching progression, teaching safety, teaching the alpine code. So the goal of the instructor is for the skier to get better. Second role is a guide. The, the guide is to be their eyes, to communicate with them. Uh, to get them down from the top of the hill to the bottom of the hill by navigating a route down the hill for them. We're going to talk about different styles of guiding. Sometimes we guide from in front of the skier. Sometimes we guide from behind the skier. Uh, but you always have to have a guide that is particularly unique to visually impaired skiers. Instructing and blocking are optional. The one thing that all VI skiers must have all the time is a guide. On beginner hills, uh, instructing and guiding are usually combined. In fact, it is quite unusual for a skier to have an instructor, a guide, and a blocker as three different people. Usually there's some kind of combination there. But it's useful to think of them independently. Personally, I find instructing and guiding people at the same time to be difficult, especially on larger hills, because if I'm guiding, I'm watching the other skiers on the hill, and if I'm instructing, I'm watching my skier to see what they are and aren't doing. And I don't have two sets of eyes. The third role is called blocking. And the goal of the blocker is to protect the visually impaired athlete. Uh, and they do this by body positioning. We're going to have a number of diagrams like this. You have to think of this as a 
bird's eye view down onto the ski hill. Downhill or down the run is down the screen. So what we see here are two skiers who are skiing diagonally across the hill to their right, our left. The one downhill is our visually impaired athlete who's wearing an orange jacket. The one uphill is our blocker who is wearing a yellow jacket. And if we imagine a high speed out of control skier coming down from the top of the hill, they would have not be able to run into the athlete because they would run into the blocker first. The blocker, simply by being uphill from the athlete, creates a protected space, something like a shadow downhill from them, where a skier that is out of control and looking to cause a collision can't get to, or at least can't get to easily. Really, we don't expect the people to be hitting the blocker. Really, what we expect people to be doing is to get it close to the blocker and then turn and ski away to avoid a collision with the blocker. And in avoiding a collision with the blocker, they implicitly avoid a collision with our athlete. If you are a beginning volunteer with a visually impaired program, you will often be given the role of blocker. Somebody with more experience will be the guide or the instructor. So blockers are often encouraged to watch what the guide is, or is doing or the instructor and learn from that. But that doesn't mean that the blocker is not an important position. Blocking is an important role and you do need to think about where am I on the slope and am I protecting the athlete from accidental collisions? So we need to take our skier up the magic carpet. If we have a blocker, then we would typically have the blocker go up first and then the athlete and then the guide. This will be a very new experience to the athlete, as it is with any new skier. Uh, and they will need encouragement. They will need talking through it. And by sending up the blocker up first, they can help with the offload of the top. If we don't have a blocker, then typically what would happen is that the guide would take their skis off. By taking their skis off and walking up beside the athlete, they can be behind the athlete when this, the athlete gets onto the magic carpet. They can be beside them as they go up the, the carpet. And the same uh, guide can be ready at the top of the carpet to receive them and help them get off. Uh, another thing that the guide or the blocker can usually helpfully do to the athlete as they get to the top of the carpet, they won't be able to see where it ends. So you can give them a countdown. You're, we're coming to the end of the carpet now. I'm going to need you to start shuffling forward in three, two, one, shuffle, shuffle, shuffle. Okay, now you're off the carpet. An approach we often take for the first few runs is skiing backwards as the guide, holding on to the skier and using their hands again with permission. And there are a couple of advantages to this. Firstly, they know that we're there. They know how close we're there and it gives them some comfort level. Uh, secondly, we can move their hands around and use their hands as a proxy for their skis. So I need you to bring your skis together like this. I need you to bring your skis apart like that. I need you to point the fronts of your skis together like this. We can even talk about, we need you to put weight on this edge down and this edge down to create a snowplow position. 
we also find that, in fact, if you move their hand, even without talking about it, their foot will often move in the same direction. So if you need more edging, turn the hand with the inside the thumb down and they will their knee and their toes will typically move in the same direction. Okay, so skiing down the hill, backwards, facing the athlete, where and when is this a good choice? It's a good choice mostly for beginners, mostly on the bunny hill, and mostly when teaching the first progression steps. Uh, some advantages, you can stop the skier from taking off in an out of control slide and going down the hill uh, at speed. Some, they may become attached to this. It's something you want to introduce and then progress away from. Uh, we don't want to become dependent on it. A technique I often use to try and wean skiers away from this is that I ski uh, in front of them backwards, but with my hands up and my palms flat, and then they can push against my hands with their palms, like the buffers on a train, um, but we can actually start to become art. Uh, they aren't, aren't touching me all the time. What happens when your skier falls? Of course, your skier is going to fall. You don't have to pick them up. You may choose to, especially if they're tired. Um, but part of your goal, especially if you're an instructor, is to teach them to get themselves up. So just as we do with any other skier, talk about pushing up with their hands, getting onto their knees, do they need to take their skis off, getting their skis parallel and across the hill before getting up, etc. Some VI specific things, if they've had a real yard sale, they may need help finding their gloves, finding their helmet, anything else that fell off. Uh, they may need help orienting themselves. It's great to say, move your feet so that your skis are across the hill but if it's pretty flat, they may not be able to figure out which way is downhill. And once they're standing up, they may need help orienting which way is downhill, which way are we setting off again. If there is a possibility of injury, you have a duty of care as an instructor or as a guide. But the goal is for them to become as independent as possible. Here's some additional equipment you might or might not use. There's nothing really VI specific here. This is equipment that we use with people either have no disabilities or have a range of disabilities. The hoop, the snowing, the ski pal helps us ski close to them, but with some space between us. Uh, the examples here are using snowboards, uh, but it could be used as an alternative to the touching hands while skiing backwards to give more space. Tip connectors, edgy wedgies, these help people keep in a snow plow. Uh, poles, the long poles like this on the bottom left, help us to induce a turn and to communicate physically direction with the skier rather than verbally. We have sliders, uh, snow sliders, bottom right. For most visually impaired athletes, I probably wouldn't use any of these. I might use the tip connectors for a day, um, but there's no real reason why a visually impaired skier who has no other uh, impairments, no other disabilities, really needs to use any of these things in the long term. So let's talk about the progression steps and on the baby hill, the bunny hill, 
we're probably talking about steps two, three, and four. When we're doing any kind of guiding, we need to be using consistent words. If the skier has to think about what we just said and interpret it, that's going to take two seconds for them to figure out what we mean and what we want them to do. And that is too long. So uh, some suggested consistent words to use. Stop. Very loud stop for an emergency stop. Slow down. Snowplow stop. Continue. Left, right, which turn, parallel turn. Three, two, one. We really want to count up rather, sorry, count down rather than count up to changes like getting on a chair, getting off the carpet ride. If we say one, two, three, nobody knows. Do we go on three or is it one, two, three? And then we go, or am I going to say four? If we say three, two, one, it's be clear that we expect the change to happen on zero. So as a guide, rein in your creativity, uh, focus on a set of words, maybe discuss them with your student first. The clock tower analogy may work for your, or clock face analogy may work for your skiers. We use it in a couple of different ways. If they're standing still, we tend to think of the direction we are facing is the 12. So we can say, okay, we're starting at the top of a run. The run goes away, goes downhill to your 10 o'clock position. So that's 60 degrees to the left of where you are currently facing. Once we're skiing, we tend to have a somewhat different perspective. Uh, when we either downhill is six or downhill is 12. To me, once we're skiing downhill, down the run is six. So three and nine are across the hill. And I often talk to my skiers about the style of turns we want. If we're on a steep hill and we want fully completed turns to control our speed, then we want to turn from nine to three. If we are on a less steep hill, we may want eights and fours so that we are always pointing somewhat downhill. And six is, let's go straight downhill because it's flattening out and we need to maintain our speed as much as possible. Basic mobility on snow. Uh, this mobility on in the environment is a term that CSIA uses. And I tend to think of it as meaning everything about skiing other than actually skiing, which would include how to put skis on, how to take skis off, how to walk uphill uh, with or without poles, what to do with your poles when you are walking around. This will probably take more time with a visually impaired skier and they may need more assistance. In this case, the guide we can see is helping the skier put their skis, uh, their boots into the bindings on the ski. Uh, they may not be able to see to do this, of course. Also, if it's one of those days where the snow gets stuck to the bottom of your boots, they may not be able to see that they have a two or three inches of snow attached to the bottom of their boot. And that's why their boot won't go into the binding properly. Gliding and stopping. Think about the fact that sliding may be a new and scary experience for them. They may feel very much out of control if they've never done any kind of a sliding sport before. On the other hand, uh, they may be lacking in fear. I've had skiers who can't see how far it is downhill, can't see the trees, and are comfortable heading off at full speed downhill where a sighted skier of that low level of skill would probably get frightened and would choose to fall over sooner. You may want to describe everything that uh, they can see and hear. This is the sound of the chairlift. This is the sound of a snowmobile. That is the sound of a snowboard and so on. 
choice of terrain is important. Uh, I, a gentle slope with flat run is out, is ideal. We want to take it carefully. We want to take it one step at a time. Uh, we ideally we want to work in quiet areas away from noisy crowds. Uh, if the communication isn't going well, that's just going to increase stress levels. Once we step beyond skiing, holding on to each other, if they've got a working snowplow, uh, we can then back off a little bit, maybe still ski backwards in front of them to catch them if necessary, but we can use verbal cues. So we can talk about things like point your toes to the left, uh, turn your ankles. We may need to show them physically what we want them to do with their ankles and with their feet or knees uh, rather than simply visually demonstrating. And again, using their hands as a proxy for their feet may be a good way to do that. Tethering is something we may want to do. It is, again, not really a visually impaired thing specifically. Um, there are a couple of different pictures here. On the top left, we are tethering from the tips of the skis. An advantage to that is you're not upsetting their balance by pulling them backwards. Uh, if you are doing that, you're going to be implicit. Uh, if you are tethering from the tips of your skis, you're kind of likely to be pulling the skis apart, so you may need something like the top right and edgy wedgy to keep them in that wedge shape. The thing on the bottom right is a climbing harness. Uh, I quite like tethering from a climbing harness. This makes the tether to their center of mass rather than unbalancing them. But it should be a temporary thing for safety and to give them a sense of confidence and safety while they learn to turn, it shouldn't be a permanent state of affairs. When is this a good choice? Beginner athletes on a bunny hill or on green slopes, people are using a snowplow for speed control, and athletes who are very anxious about losing their control. So let's think about using bigger hills. We've got our skier doing snowplow turns linked together on the beginner hill, or they are already past that point when we met them. We're now going to take them up onto full-size blue runs, green runs, chairlifts, etc. First thing to think about is something called the learning contract or the guiding contract. This is a CSIA concept that says, before you get out on the hill with a new skier, discuss for a few minutes, what do they actually want? Do they need a guide? Do they need an instructor? Do they want an instructor today or not? Uh, and how do they feel about touching? Uh, can you touch their hands, their legs? Do they want to request each time? How about them touching you? And also a whole bunch of things that go into any learning contract with any skier. What kinds of runs do we want to do today? How do we feel about the temperature today? Um, are we confident on blue runs? Do they want to learn technique? Do they want to just have fun? Talking some more about blocking on the larger size hill. Uh, so here we have a guide that is leading the athlete. And if the guide is leading the athlete, the blocker really wants to ideally protect them both, but mostly the athlete. So the blocker is going to be uphill, uh, a little bit ahead of the VI athlete generating that protected area uh, by being in the way of somebody who might be on a collision course with our athlete. Ideal spacing is about three meters to 10 meters. 
the faster people are going, the more space they need to be spread out. And generally, the blocker isn't going to be talking during the run. The athlete needs to focus on their skiing. They need to be able to hear the guide. A commentary from the blocker would probably just be more confusing. If we think about the positioning of the blocker versus the positioning of the athlete and their tracks down the hill, the blocker needs to be uphill and ahead as the skier traverses. So as the skier then starts to turn, the blocker is already further across the hill. They need to get around the corner and then back ahead of the skier. So eventually, as we look back up the hill, the athlete will have a narrower track going down the hill. The blocker will be wider on both sides and will be skiing consistently faster because they're always trying to complete that turn, catch up and get ahead of their athlete. If the guide is behind the athlete, then still the blocker needs to focus on protecting the uh, athlete, but the guide themselves is effectively doing some blocking work as well. Uh, they're going to be creating some protected area implicitly. So the blocker is usually behind, usually uphill. There's a couple of situations where the blocker can be helpful in other ways, maybe more like an assistant guide. If I am skiing behind my skier as the guide, they may do something like go around a corner over a blind ridge and they will go over it before I can see what is the other side of it. That's a problem. That's dangerous. Uh, what I can do is send my blocker ahead and get them to go to the ridge, uh, go to the point where two trails merge, look around and give me a signal on is it safe to pass? Do we need to stop? Is there a problem around the corner that I can't see? yet. In Calabogie, there is a run called KMP, where I think this is very useful. Three or four other runs merge with it, uh, and it has a couple of blind ridges as it goes up and down. You really need your blocker ahead of you, holding up signs, and maybe it's a thumbs up for continue, and maybe it's crossed arms for stop there's a big problem ahead. Blocker can also help as a helper in other ways. They can sift with loading and unloading from chairlifts. They may be able to pick up gloves or goggles if they get dropped on the hill, help the skier uh, get up. There's no particular reason why the blocker has to do this rather than the guide or the instructor, um, but sharing the load uh, helps avoid people getting tired. And if the athlete or the guide gets injured or gets crashed, the blocker could be sent downhill to get ski patrol. So let's talk some more about guiding. Okay, guiding is to, the goal is to be their eyes, to communicate with them. So you're going to negotiate which run you're going to use. Both of you have to be comfortable with the runs that you're taking. Uh, as a guide, you should think big. Uh, you need to plan the route down the hill as far as you can see. If there's a ski school class on the left-hand side, probably better to go to the right-hand side than to try and thread your way through them. But you don't necessarily have to tell your skier that from their perspective, you're going to execute small. You're going to just say, turn left, turn right, traverse, keep going, be ready to turn, and so on. Even before the first run of the day, uh, you may want to start your guiding by describing the snow conditions, the traffic conditions, the weather conditions. Uh, this will help 
set both of you at a similar level of expectation. And it also helps develop a trust between you, which is going to be vitally important once you're skiing down the hill. Eventually, you're going to want to go up a chairlift. If this is their first time on a chairlift, you may need to explain what a chairlift is and what it does. From the very basics, that there is a long cable in a loop going from the bottom of the hill to the top and back. There is an engine which is making it turn. There are pillars holding it up and there are chairs hanging from it and, and so on. Uh, you may also need to talk about the load and the unload sequence and the fact that as you go through the maze, as you get onto the chair, you're going to be giving them, them instructions on when to stand still, when to shuffle forward, when to sit down, and so on. So, not just the first time that they use a chairlift, but every time they use a chairlift, you're going to need to be doing guiding before they load. Okay. Let's listen to a recording of the kind of conversation or commentary that comes out of a guide while getting onto the chairlift. Okay, let's get ready to ride the chair. Uh, Steve, I'm on your right. Pete, can you go around to Steve's left? Okay, we're lined up now. So let's shuffle forward, shuffle, shuffle, shuffle. And now we've got to do a slow U-turn to our left. So shuffling and turning, shuffling and turning, shuffling and turning. About 45 degrees more, shuffling and turning, and stop. Okay, we're in the uh, maze now. And shuffle forward, stop. Shuffle forward, stop. Forward, stop. Okay, now we've got to make a 90 degree right turn. So uh, remember, I'm on the inside of the turn. So shuffle, shuffle and turn, shuffle and turn, shuffle and turn. We're good. Forward, shuffle, shuffle, shuffle. Right, now we're at the little gates which check your uh, pass. So you're going to shuffle forward and you should hear a beep and I'll see you on the other side. You are lined up. Shuffle, shuffle, shuffle. Okay, we're through the gates. Uh, now, I'm holding a pole out. Can you reach forward and grab my pole? And that should keep the three of us lined up perfectly. Let's go. Shuffle, 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 stop. We're at the front of the line now, just waiting for the chair in front of us. And we're going to go three, two, one, forward. Shuffle, 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 and stop. And the chair's coming in three, two, one, sit. Okay, bar coming down, and away we go. So a couple of things that we heard there. The conversation was almost continuous, very detailed commands. Uh, a couple of things that are useful that we heard happening. One was that the blocker or the assistant guide was sent around to the other side so that the three people guide skier blocker were lined up together uh, the other thing is that they used a ski pole holding the ski pole across the front of the three of them so that they could line up exactly particularly on that last section of being ready on the red line for the chair to scoop you up. Okay, let's get ready to... Solid. 
once you're on the chair, uh, you may want to just do the normal thing of relaxing a little bit, um, talking about the run before, talking about the run you're going to do. You may also want to explain to them how the sequence to get off the chair is going to work. So we'll talk about when we get to the top, I'm going to need you to lift your skis up at the tip and then we will give you a countdown to get off. And when I say three, two, one, we will then stand. So unloading from the chair might sound something like this. Coming up to the end of the chairlift now, going past the last pole and bar going up and tips up and three, two, one, touch down, three, two, one, stand up and ski with me, ski with me, ski with me to a stop. So there we had a three, two, one touchdown and then a three, two, one stand up. Depending on the time of your chair left, it might be three, two, one touchdown stand up. In the picture, we can see the skier and the guide again using a pair of ski poles to maintain contact between them so that we can feel where the other person is standing up and where they are, uh, even though we are side by side. Coming up. So let's talk about guiding, uh, different ways of guiding. One way to guide is to ski behind them. Uh, when and where is this a good choice? Mostly intermediate athletes and mostly on green or blue slopes, mostly when you're going fairly low, slowly. Uh, and particularly if you have a fully blind skier, where they cannot follow you so uh, it's important that they can hear you and what you can do from behind of course is that you can shout and you are facing them and they can probably hear you well so it allows your voice to be heard well you can keep the athlete in sight give detailed instructions you have to stay close so they can hear you particularly uh, on ice. So it can be difficult for them to hear. You may need to shout or stay very close. Distance becomes a balance. You need to be far enough apart to avoid hitting each other, close enough to be heard. And you need to negotiate and agree ahead a code word for an emergency stop. Uh, so that if you fall over, you can just shout it. You may also need to agree what are these the ski are going to do if they can no longer hear you. Probably they need to just stop. Uh, you might have fallen, or there just might be a uh, sound problem. You need to think about the lead time. When you say turn left, they're not going to turn left immediately. It's going to take about two seconds for them to hear you process it and then start turning. So if you are going down, getting close to the side of the run, you need to give them a sufficient lead time rather than waiting for them to be right at the edge of the run. So here's a video uh, of some intermediate skiers using a skiing guiding by the lead yeah. 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 on a blue rock.
So what is the athlete actually following here? Uh, or skiers with some usable vision, which was the case with this skier, they are following their guide, keeping their eyes on their guide, and the big yellow vest may help with that. Uh, They may also be looking at visually where is the guide in terms of height in front of them and using that to gauge the steepness of the slope. If the guide goes down, that would suggest that the slope is getting steeper. If the guide goes up, that would suggest that the slope is flattening out. We're also guided skiers by leading where they were fully blind and they were following the sound of my skis or the sound of me tapping my poles behind them. Uh, we've also seen bells and beepers and voice instructions. So this is suitable for intermediate and advanced skiers who can control their own speed on more advanced slopes and going somewhat faster. And maybe the skier has sufficient vision to actually see you. The big danger with this is that uh, if the skier falls, the guide may not realize it and maybe two or three runs further down the hill before they notice and stop. And now you've got a problem getting back together again. It can be avoided if the guide is constantly looking over their shoulder uh, or, as in this case, there is a blocker who is the cameraman who is following the skier down. You'll notice that in this case, the we couldn't hear any communication between the skier and the guide. It is hard to do voice communication when skiing in front, because as a guide, your voice is going downhill and they are uphill. You would have to turn your head around backwards uh, to successfully communicate each turn to them. But in this case, what they're actually doing is using a radio headset. I think these are a great thing for skiing. Uh, the example on the right, the photograph is actually a motorcycle headset, but they are really the same it. Radio can be used for motorcycling and for skiing. It allows for two-way communication and it allows for you to talk at a fairly normal volume rather than shouting. And that in itself seems to make it easier to have more subtle conversations and say, we need to turn to the left a little bit rather than left. So this... Uh, Okay, which run do you want to do? Let's do Barrett's. Okay. We'll be heading out at your five o'clock. You ready? Ready. All right. Three, two, one. Off we go. Okay, it's uh, pretty flat here. We'll go for fives and sevens. Just keep some nice even turns. Getting flatter. I go for straight six. Just follow me. Following following, following. We're coming up on a big right-hand corner, going around the big right-hand corner, and it's getting steeper. Uh, can you slow down a bit? How's that? Better. Okay. Still quite steep. Uh, stay with the threes and nines. Uh, coming up on the join with the other run. Nobody's coming in. We're cool. We're past it. There's a ski group on the left. We're going to move over to the right to avoid them. We've gone past them. Now there's some snowboarders jumping in and out of the trees on the right, so I'm going to head to the left to avoid them. Uh, flattening out, fives and sevens. Okay, coming up on the big slow sign. I'm going to go left of the slow sign. I've lost you. Okay, stop where you are. All right, I've stopped now. I'm looking uphill. I see you. Uh, head off, uh, head off uh, towards your seven. 
and turn left and turn right, turn left, turn right and left and right and stop there. I'm at your five o'clock, about 30 yards away. Do you see me now? Yes, see you. Okay, great. Just ski over towards me and stop there. All right, we're done. We're ready. We'll get ready for the second half of the run. Okay, so that's the kind of conversation we would usually hear over these radio headsets. Uh, not so much of the explicit turn left, turn right now, because the skier is following the guide and can figure out when to turn left and turn right by watching them. Uh, Two-way communication, so we can have conversations on, can we go a bit slower, can we go a bit faster? And the really big one was the conversation of, I've lost you, I can't see you anymore when the guide stopped and then by looking uphill was able to remotely give the instructions. These things, because they were designed for motorcycles, are typically good for up to a kilometer apart and have noise cancelling a good at cutting out things like ice noise. So I would strongly recommend them. Technologically, what we see on the left hand side, you've got two ear phones. Uh, that will be placed inside the helmet. Uh, we've got a microphone and then we've got a cradle and the actual radio that fits into it. It takes about 10 minutes to put one of these into a helmet. Uh, you often will want to use tape. I have found that my preference is actually painter's masking tape, not because it sticks particularly well, but actually because it doesn't. Uh, with masking tape, I can take it apart at the end of the day and move the radio to another helmet. Uh, if I use something like duct tape, then I may be pulling the radio apart or the helmet apart to try and disassemble it. Okay, which run do you uh, want to do? Another approach is using a backpack speaker in this case, we're following, or the, the guide is leading the athlete who is following again, but rather than having radio headsets, the guide has a microphone and a big PA system or speaker on their back, creating a cone of sound projecting back up the hill. And the athlete is following the instructions. And of course, we still have a blocker. So let's watch a video of that in action. So that was from the viewpoint of the blocker behind the skier. We could just about hear the guide. The skier presumably could hear them better since they were following the instructions. Uh, but they were probably also following where the instructions are coming from, listening for the source of the sound as well as what's actually being said. This is the advantage of a backpack over a radio headset. Uh, the skier can detect their guide's position from the sound. On the other hand, what they can't do is hear as clearly uh, what they're being asked to do. So uh, I have mainly seen this uh, or used this with fully blind skiers where they care 
at least as much about where the sound is coming from than what you are saying. They're really following your sound. Pros and cons, well, you don't get hoarse from shouting compared to doing it without a backpack speaker. You can keep a greater separation than just shouting. On the other hand, it doesn't allow for a two-way conversation, unlike the radio headsets, and the sound quality diminishes with distance. Uh, as we saw in the video, you can get ice noise. And many other people on the hill will be able to hear your conversation, whether they want to or not, or whether you want to hit them to hear you or not. Unlike the headset radio, if you get separated, you're not going to be able to talk the skier back down from a range. So you really need a blocker or a tail gunner, the person taking the video in this case, who will take over as the guide in the worst case scenario. So in order to work with this, uh, you may need to use very consistent words because- Okay, the sound I'm gonna be starting off low. towards your 10 o'clock. It'll be- Just uh, stop that. Um, so this is a system that uh, a skier called Kenny, who's actually the skier in the previous video, developed. Uh, this is his pr preferred verbiage. So every instruction is essentially the same. You're going to say turn or roll, which means a gentle turn. You're going to say left or right. You're going to prefix all of that with and. And and gets them ready that there is an instruction coming and they may even start shifting their weight immediately. So you can say and turn left and turn right and roll left and roll right. You can add up or down at the end if you've got a false four line. So if the run is going straight ahead, but the slope is down to the left, then when you turn to the right, that's almost gonna feel like you're going uphill. So that's an and turn right up, and turn left down. When you turn left, you're going to accelerate quickly because you're essentially going down the four line at that point. There are a couple of other su suggested words there, pitch, straight, and to a stop, stop. So we could say, and turn left, up to a stop, stop. One of the reasons Kenny likes the, these phrases and these words is that it makes each instruction very predictable, following a very similar pattern. He's also picked these specific words so that they all have some different vowel sounds. So even if the sound quality uh, is poor due to ambient noise, he's still going to be able to uh, understand what you're saying. So we avoid words like continue. We avoid editorializing and uh, varying our communication. Using some other kinds of lifts, uh, using a gondola or a cable card, well, you're gonna take your skis or boards off. You may loosen your boots which may not be obvious to the VI skier, they may not see other people around them loosening their boots. You're gonna guide them much the same way uh, as we did guiding through the in the lodge with a hand on your shoulder or a hand on your elbow. You may ask your blocker to carry the skis. A poma or a T-bar, we would need to explain it first. We may wanna demonstrate practice with the ski pole or with an arm pole. So they're not surprised when they get pulled. A T bar is probably better than a Palmer for a VI skier because you can share the T with your guide. Uh, with a Palmer, you're going to have to, one of you is going to have to go up first. So I would use the same sequence that I did uh, for a magic carpet send the blocker up first, skier up second, guide up third and then the blocker can help 
with the on mode. Finally, thinking about instructing rather than guiding. We're now on the bigger hills talking about linking turns and turn progression to parallel and behind. The instructions, the drills uh, really here are the same as for any other athlete. This is where VI skiing is really essentially the same as teaching able-bodied skiing. As we get into linking turns, we're going to move into that guiding mode where we're spending more time telling them verbally turn left, turn right, turn tighter, and we're going to increase the separation between us. Whenever we're introducing a new skill, we probably want to do it on minimal terrain for safety reasons. And you may need to communicate and tell them that something is working. They may not realize that they have, in fact, successfully turned or that they've turned enough uh, because they just can't see that. As we get into faster runs and higher speeds, uh, we're going probably going to move away from that skiing backwards in front of them. We're going to move to either guiding them from behind by shouting or guiding them from in front with them following us. We can use all the same drills to all their skiing that we would do with the general public, uh, tapping skis, moving in and out of the wedge, uh, thinking about your weight and your position and pressure, etc. As well as skiing, as an instructor, you are responsible for teaching your skiers the Alpine Code of Responsibility. They will have a guide with them, and therefore some of these elements, deciding where to stop from, uh, and starting in, will be the responsibility of the guide rather than the skier. But the skier really need, still needs to understand these things and needs to be aware of their responsibility in keeping the slopes safe. That's it for this course. Uh, hopefully you now have a feeling for how a ski lesson with a visually impaired skier goes, how you can understand their vision, how you can guide them through the lodge through understanding equipment, through lift lines, and how you can teach them to ski and modify how you teach them to ski to allow for their uh, visual impairment. And ultimately, the different options leading from in front, leading from behind, using shouting, using radios, using a backpack speaker for guiding good skiers around big mountains. Thanks for taking your time. I hope this was useful. Uh, send me your comments in the links below.